Hello, hello, and thank you everyone for coming. I'm honored to share the stage with Antoni Aniabona uh, today. So as mentioned, I'm Petra Koivara from Green Code Ventures, investing in uh, seed to series A digital green startups across Europe. So Antoni, congrats on the acquisition and great news on the round as well yesterday. Thank you, thank you. No, it's, uh, I think that the round especially kind of like, you know, created an extra momentum and boost to this whole uh, partnership uh, that we are on with right now as, a, as an Aura entity. So very excited of the future and excited as well, like to share this audience a, a bit about how to approach an acquisition from a founder's perspective, the things that MA, M and A uh, people and lawyers won't tell you. Great. Uh, so, for our audience here, maybe you can share a bit uh, more about the, the founding story of Veri and uh, why did you start building it? Sure. Years 2020, 2019. Um, me and my co-founder were in San Francisco. I was working at the time for a company called Meru Health uh, in the mental health space, and uh, my co-founder uh, Vern. He was working for a company called Aura. Um, so full circle, and um, we we started thinking about ways of how we could quantify nutrition and diet better. We had you know, the sleep wearables and the activity wearables, like all of these things that were closing feedback loops very well on sleep and activity, but we weren't seeing anything on nutrition. And you know, sort of like from our own personal experiences of struggling with our own metabolic health, seeing most of the people in the world, unfortunately in the US, 88% of the population is considered metabolically unhealthy. So many people were struggling with this current methods weren't working, so we decided to build something in the space. We met our third co-founder, Franz, when we were in, in, uh, at, um, in San Francisco. He was at, at Stanford at the time and uh, came to a barbecue that we hosted for Finnish folks in uh, very typical Meru Health fashion. <laughs> um, and um, we, we kind of like, the three of us fell in love with each other and of the idea of working together. And, uh, and uh, yeah, then after that, we sort of like very, very became a, a thing and, uh, and uh, we, we started building the company when we returned back to Finland. Okay, great. And now uh, exciting news uh, on the acquisition front. Yes. Uh, so uh, how did that actually happen? Can you elaborate a bit on the process uh, from the early days to then where you are today? Yeah, for sure. I think um, like the big, big thing about like an acquisition or maybe like a stand that I have is, is, is um, and it's like an adage, like everyone says this, but um, in a way, like good, good, good companies don't uh, don't sell; they get acquired. Um, and I think that there's kind of like a, there's truth to that, but there is as well like ways how you can sort of like manage that and make that sort of like a, a positive optionality down the route. And and for us, it was really very much of of uh, you know we were always focused on building the best possible business in our own sector, like, or the best possible business that, that we could imagine. Um, and um, when we sort of like approach that, then a very topical question, especially when you start scaling is, who are the best companies in the wor world with who we can work with, right? So we started talking with not only Aura, but like a lot of other companies and basically foreign partnerships where we could, we could uh, scale the company faster. And uh, we, we sort of like became friends with Tom, the CEO of Aura, and uh, you know, we, every, every time we were in the same city, whether that was New York, Helsinki, or San Francisco, like we would text each other and say, hey, I'm in the city, let's meet. We would talk about you know, how the space is moving forward, how we, can, how we could potentially like, do things together. We launched a partnership in, gosh, maybe a year, year and a half ago where we did our first sort of like integration with Aura and like bigger sort of like uh, push together as, as uh, Aura data coming together with, uh, with, uh, with very data. Um, and um, yeah, then at some point, I think it was maybe May, um, May this year in Helsinki, Tom was here for a board meeting. Uh, we we got, got together and he said, I think we, we need to work together um, and, um, and uh, should we, should we sort of like put our forces together and build the next frontier of metabolic health and, and, uh, and so on. So that, that's kind of like the DNA, how the deal came together. Yeah, and um, uh, I would love to talk a bit more about the, the relationship building and, and kind of that side of it. So, 
So building the relationships to potential acquirers, or obviously partnerships and, and all that. But can you elaborate a bit more on that? So it's a, it's a people business. Yeah, it's a people business. I think it's relatively simple, really. Like, uh, it's, it's kind of like, um, this is well, like, something that I hear a lot of, and I've, I've tried to take advice. This is very hard. When you're building your business, it's very hard to look sort of like outside and say that some of these things that I'm going to do uh, don't seem like so immediate. And when you're looking at that thing, you're trying to find product market fit and sort of like justifying you spending time anywhere else is very difficult. But I think that there is like an efficient, good way of trying to really like constantly build relationships, whether that was with like potential acquirers, whether that was with, with partners, whether that was with the investors, like a lot of really good, the people that have like, I know that have raised like hundreds of millions of, 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 of dollars and euros are constantly raising money. It's not like they run these like very specific funding rounds. They're constantly talking with people, trying to sort of like see if there's ways how they can work together, like good sources of capital and, and, uh, and so on. So I think with, with in a way like that relationship and people business, like at the end of the day, people make still hopefully for uh, the foreseeable future, probably not, but people still make the decisions when it comes to like acquisitions. And if you have like really good uh, relationship with whoever is the deciding, deciding person there, then, you know, they, they kind of like fall into place, whether that was an ac acquirer or, uh, or an investor. Yeah. A lot of advice there already, but anything else that you'd like to share? Any concrete tips for companies that are maybe um, approaching this potential acquisition or? <coughs> Yeah, well, like I think when you're approaching an acquisition uh, is uh, like one thing that you really have to think about. And, and we definitely like spend a lot of time on this is like really clarifying the why, like really clarifying, like what is the outcome of like making this acquisition, right? So for us, our vision, our mission in the company was to end the metabolic health crisis. So I went back to that and I asked myself, if we get acquired, if we join forces with Aura, are we able to accelerate the Delta of that becoming true? Like, are we able to get there faster as a company versus going ourselves? And I think that the, like a very clear sort of like easy answer there was yes. Right, we are able to get there faster. We'll have like way less financial constraint with Aura having raised what now 472 million USD, five billion valuation. So there's like a different kind of like stability that there comes in that. Then another thing is obviously as well of like, is there more resources? Yes, there is more resources. Aura, we were a 30-ish people team. Aura is a 700 people team with amazing, amazing talent from across the world, but especially in the US market, where, which was as well like our main market and where, where this sort of like seismic shift of metabolic health is truly happening um, and, uh, and other things as well. So kind of like instead of like binary, binary thinking, like does this make sense or not? A lot of people will come and say, when you see an acquisition, you know if it's good or not. Um, I call it B, BS in a way, like to a certain degree. I think that, you know, you have to like run through all of these scenarios and really sort of like boil it down to different points and, you know, financial constraints um, and thinking about it from the, from the standpoint of like talent, market access, um, and as well, like sort of like strategic mode, like what is this are these companies coming together like one plus one equals two or is it one plus one equals equals uh, five or equals ten right so trying to think about it from that framework kind of like boils it down into not thinking about it necessarily so bin binarily that you know sort of like tends to happen oftentimes yeah I like that thanks a lot for sharing um, so maybe a more specific question then so how do you increase your bargaining power as a startup so so what are the concrete actions for the audience here for the founders and future founders here uh, that you can do comes a lot down to I think you know when you are the sort of like the smaller party in like an acquisition in a, as an acquisition target I think it comes down a lot to every case is different but one of the b best things you can do here as you can do as well like with uh, with 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 funding is to create competition right so you you create competition uh, by, uh, by 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 obviously creating competition, having more acquirers that uh, that are interested in acquiring you. So being able to generate that as quickly as possible when you're in the in the negotiations is going to help you a lot with like valuation terms, whatnot. Also, as well, like I think uh, other things as well, like seeking funding, right? Like being able to really start um, a fundraise very quickly when you're approaching an acquisition process is great. That creates leverage, and when you have an acquisition offer on the table. 
a lot of funds will be interested in you as well, depending a lot on the on the stage. But especially like you know towards Series A, Series B, where we were, where it's kind of like okay, every single fund, as you can probably uh, as well like acknowledge or or agree on that, every single fund is as well like looking at okay, what is the what is the exit path here? So if you have that path already and someone is showing that, a lot of investors will feel that they're de-risked of like making this investment. So you can use that on your own leverage as well of like, hey, we have an acquisition offer, we can take this or we can build this company ourselves with you. Do you want in or not, right? So that creates like a nice, you know, um, a nice sort of like balance to as well, like to the negotiation. I've heard, I've heard uh, an other Finnish company, very successful company has multiple times always when they go to basically raise more money they will get an acquisition offer on the table and be to the investors that we have an acquisition offer if this is the valuation this is going to be the price so they are really like driving those fundraisers as well like very much driven by this like these m a deals that they're driving on the side so obviously not every company can do that, uh, but it's it's a it's a position that in some industries, especially, might be more feasible uh, versus versus others. And I think that the last thing uh, really is as well, like I think when you are in an acquisition process, you really want to create like as much leverage to you as possible. And one way one way as well, like to create leverage, is to basically just tune for profitability. So if you are able to, you know, maybe it is sort of like strategically focus on some certain you know, aspect of the business, um, you know, cutting some costs and being able to be in a position where you're like, okay, we're default profitable, we're default alive, we don't have to do this. I think that will do two things. That will do something to your psyche where you are like, okay, I'm not gonna go bankrupt if I don't sell now, which might be like true in some cases. And then another thing that, 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 that does is as well like, it creates leverage, obviously, because you don't need to take the money, and you're going to be like much more stronger in the in the negotiations when the the purchaser is not sort of like sensing and smelling fear in you know your just sheer existence. Yeah. So um, I think those are sort of like concrete tips. What. Uh, what to think about and how to create leverage as a smaller company. Yeah, and may maybe building on that, so so as an investor, we obviously need to have those, I mean, some idea of, of some of the exit paths in the future when we're uh, investing in a company. So um, kind of w how did you plan for it? So from the beginning, was it like a yearly exercise? Did you discuss it with the board uh, every time? Kind of like how was it involved in the strategy, strategy of the company? Yeah, that's uh, and you know we talked about this earlier as well, like a lot of uh, uh, the. Uh, I think that the core difference, like between obviously like you know VCs and and uh, and and kind of like founders, is like obviously depending on the founder. But most founders, I feel like the the, the it's kind of like the incentives are in a way like aligned, but in a way misaligned, right? Like we personally were just focused on like building the best possible business. We didn't really like entertain even the idea of an acquisition uh, in in the in the in the road. I think it kind of like if you think about like an acquisition a lot, it, it steers, it puts your energy in, a, in the wrong things. You know, like there was like really great um, a session yesterday on this stage from, um, um, God, I, I forget his name, but uh, he's a, he was the uh, designer for, for Beats, Beats by Dr. Dre, um, and like a bunch of different products as well, like uh, uh, in, uh, no, known in the world. And he said something that really like stuck with me, which is like, there's like certain characteristics and certain energy in, in founders that build great things versus good things and I think like that greatness really comes from like being obsessed of the details and being able to sort of like expand and expand your mind into into thinking about a place in a world where you are really like in an IPO situation where you drive the company to the absolute like edge of the world which means the best possible outcome and you're focused on that solely if you do that well the acquis acquisitions and the acquirers will come but like my really like my key takeaway is um, it's also like there's also things that you can do that are aligned with that and your energy and your thoughts are more aligned on that by creating these partnerships and scaling the business itself forward faster, right? So um, long-winded way of answering the question, we didn't think about it at all. It wasn't like a board you know, meeting thing. It uh, came very naturally to kind of like, um, you know, human to human interaction um, um, with, uh, with 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 different parties. Yeah, maybe kind of naturally when you approach 
the end of the runway or you need to plan for the next step. So maybe naturally you take a look at all the options. So whether yeah. it be a, a funding round or then an acquisition. Yeah, exactly. Um, anything surprising that you'd like to share uh, about uh, the, the acquisition process? So anything that really surprised you or kind of uh, you thought that was going to be different? I went a bit off script here. Yeah, so the, give, give yeah the, <laughs> the process itself, anything surprising? I think, well, I think there's a lot of, lot of surprising things, right? I, it's very interesting how very quickly the, when the acquisition process becomes an acquisition process, it really starts looking like that versus what it has been in the, in the, in the past, right? So um, <clears throat> this is kind of like a point where all of the lawyers get involved and like the M, uh, like, um, 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 M&A, everything, all of that starts happening. It becomes very, very kind of like strategic and tactical and goes away from, you know, that will, what, what it was in the past. So probably there like a tip or thought to think about is, 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 is as well. Like you as a founder, you're probably thinking a lot, of, a lot about of it, of the acquisition process that, yeah, it's going to go as, as, as it was sort of like in the, in the past as well, where, you know, we're going to be talking with the CEO mainly and just sort of like jamming this deal together. Um, but uh, actually it, it changes very much. Um, and you should be as well, like prepared to that in a way of, it's not, it's not like impolite for you to as well like pull in like the M&A and the lawyers and all of that stuff, um, which I wish I would have like understood a bit <laughs> earlier. But uh, we we sort of like you know um, everything was was good and uh, at the at the end of the day. Yeah, amazing. So let's now move to, towards the time uh, after the acquisition. So it's it's it hasn't been too long yet. Uh, but, but I think overall, um, as, as we read the stats, so a lot of the mergers and acquisitions actually fail. Uh, so maybe there isn't proper cultural alignment. There are a lot of reasons. So uh, can you a bit uh, elaborate on, on what did you, how did you work with Aura to ensure that there was this cultural alignment and, and this fit uh, for them to acquire you? Yeah, cultural alignment is huge, and this is something that, like, not a lot of people will talk talk to you about. Like, one of the one of sort of like my 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 my, my mentors, like over the past and over the time, um, has been here at Slush as well. Like in the past, um, built tremendous consumer products um, in uh, in the U.S. and you know top top notch guy. His company got acquired with a with a lot bigger company, one of the one of the one of the great greats, um, and uh, he has he's talked a lot about the fact of like how acquisition, like how like like the, in the acquisition culture alignment was such a huge piece of it, like how to make sure that that is true, because very often, like especially when you're a lot more smaller company, you go into a bigger company, like just cultures can be like very very different, and uh, I think like for us one of the ways how we sort of like tactically navigated that was I had known Tom for, for, for a while already, so I knew him, like I had talked with him, I, I knew a lot about Aura as like an other sort of like fellow Finnish company. Vern had worked there, so we kind of like knew what's happening there, what they were really good at and what, you know, what were sort of like maybe a bit, bit misaligned of, uh, of, uh, of, of our values, uh, so to say. And uh, during the acquisition process, actually, we established like you know, kind of like working group. So we were working, like actually the team was working together with their team and doing, doing sprints. And that's the best way of really learning if this is, a, if this is the proper home for your company, right? Um, so both parties were sort of like putting their best into that and sh showing that we can be much more stronger together. So if you have that opportunity, if it tactically as well like makes sense, then there's po possibly a, 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 an opportunity of trying to trying to do that uh, together with the acquiree where you you are really like working together before before that but um I think that the, you know, sort of like if culture alignment goes wrong, that can be like very devastating to as well, like to the deal. Like you, you kind of like probably think, depending on like if you've done an acquisition or not, but you probably think about it as like, okay, you know, we signed the papers, the deal is closed, but it's actually not at all like that, right? So if, if, the, if the process go, basically goes south, that there isn't cultural alignment, what can easily happen, it, it, it kind of like is, operational friction comes first you know everything that we're trying to do is not quite working and we're not like satisfied with each other 
then talent will start like you know jumping left and right like the people the assets uh, the assets as the people and like other assets that the acquirer is buying are starting to leave the company and that kind of like leads to erosion of value and over time then you know that can be very detrimental as well like to the success of the acquisition um, um, e even sort of like from a from a financial point of view depending on like your terms and stuff but um, that's something that uh, that kind of like pattern uh, easily leads to um, super bad outcomes. So being able to really sort of like manage that and, and uh, really ensure the cultural alignment is there, I think is super, super, super important. And uh, now, uh, a few months after the acquisition, so, so was it true? Uh, did you have a, a right feeling about the cultural alignment or, or can you elaborate a bit on that? How, how has it started? I think so. I think so. Like, you know, the companies are very uh, sort of like we both as companies are very human centric. Like we, you know, we had a uh, we basically have um, have a value and had a value of like putting people first um, at very. And that is like very true at, as well at Aura. Like I can see that very, very well. Like it's it's very human, like the brand, how we do things. Um, obviously, you know, the fact that like health is wealth is very clear at the, at the at, like inside of Aura, like a lot of people there. At, as well, like sort of like buy into the fact that, you know, health is the most valuable asset that we have. I think also sort of like the fact that um, <clears throat> We have, a, we have a value at Aura, which is aim higher. Um, and uh, I, I really feel that uh, that is something as well. Like we were very sort of like focused on, even though it wasn't like exactly a value, we were very much of a company of like, you know, just really sort of like trying to conquer the world and do the best possible job and do the best possible like great things versus good things. So I think a lot of these are, are coming true. I think maybe like the biggest sort of like uh, challenge so to say, maybe challenge, maybe uh, maybe kind of like a uh, slight misalignment is is sort of like just the execution, like of you know speed. But again, like you know, we were a 30 people company or as a 700 people company, so it's uh, it's the speed just slows down a bit. Um, but uh, you know, we're working we're working on it like together, and I think like the good thing is that everyone is aligned that we need to we need to work on it and and uh, and, and improve it overall uh, for us to be you know sort of like the best company in the world yeah and can you um, elaborate a bit on kind of how do you work inside aura so i think it was interesting what you shared that you have kind of been able to maintain this uh, maybe entrepreneurial um, kind of a view to it and, and kind of how you can still work a lot with uh, so you're not maybe fully everyone is integrated and spread out the organization yeah but working with the with yeah the definitely like we, we basically form a form like a squad inside of inside of the company and that's sort of like or new business opportunity as like metabolic health so we're very much continuing the same things that we were doing at very just now with more resources and so on so yeah it's uh it's it's kind of like a, a good good setup for for a startup as well to operate and have autonomy, but at the same time still, you know, um, uh, build uh, build unison and, and, and stuff together with the rest of the organization. Yeah, no, and that's, I think, a really concrete example of how you can do it. Um, then how have you kind of made sure that the val value is actu actually captured now and, and then in the future? So, I don't know, maybe there isn't a plan of how uh, you're going to work as as. Uh, part of the company for the next X amount of years, but how do you kind of continuously make sure that the people want to work, that we usually worked uh, or previously worked at Berry, that they actually like working there, uh, they kind of are integrated? Um, how do you work with that personally? Yeah, well, like I think I think it's a constantly sort of like working on like looking at like that cultural alignment and like making sure, as in it would be anywhere else, like making sure that people are happy, people feel like fulfilled, and people feel that they're going like towards like good opportunities, right? So you know, for 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 seeing that, but someone, I think it was Markus Willig from from Bolt who said very well that uh, when um, when the company is growing really fast, like no one cares about the you know the the fluff around it right so <laughs> i think uh, i think being just able to execute execute on the company making sure that it grows very fast um people will be pretty content and happy so um just sort of like uh you know both both sides both sides really yeah. right now it's like very much of like every second counts energy that tom likes to say all the time and and uh and uh that um that that really sort of like right now is the moment to build the next sort of a like consumer a great like technology company coming out of Finland after after Nokia. So that's sort of like what we're going after. Yeah, amazing. So we have a few minutes left. So uh, any, what do you want to leave the audience with? So any closing remarks? 
I think I've said it like multiple times, but uh, really like um, um, just try to play like as much like positive optionality as possible and uh, try and focus on like the business itself, not acquisition. It's a good bonus. Um, I wish I wish that every fun founder sort of like um, whatever path you take, like you just focus on actually like the, the business itself making it as like the best outcome possible. And one really good way of doing that is like partnering with uh, with sort of like world leading companies and, and uh, you know that that can easily um, sort of like lead up to lead up to a situation the situation like where we found ourselves. Um, so that that's sort of like the closing thoughts and and tips going forward. Great. Thanks so much and all the best for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.